Coming up, health advocates are celebrating 50 years at the National Indian Health Board, and the Native American Journalists Association could get a new name. Plus, a new Indigenous-led school opens in Rapid City. We'll see how the first few weeks are going. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amarawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start in California, where Indigenous actress Sasheen Littlefeather was honored over the weekend by a prestigious body. On Saturday, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures read an apology to the Apache and Yaki actress. It came nearly 50 years after Littlefeather was booed and mistreated at the 1973 Oscar Awards. At the time, she was asked by Godfather actor Marlon Brando to reject the award. They wanted to bring attention to the harms inflicted on Native people by the film industry. The event Saturday in Los Angeles allowed Little Feather to give her side of the story. She was honored with songs and dancing. Little Feather took the time to acknowledge Native people at the event. Now I would like all the Indian people in this audience to stand. Please take a deep breath. Look at you all. Look at our people. Look at each other and be proud that we stand as survivors, all of us. Little Feather, who is now 75, told ICT she has no regrets. Her family says she is sick with terminal cancer. Please, when I am gone, always be reminded that whenever you stand for your truth, you will be keeping my voice and the voices of our nations and our people alive. There are new efforts underway to advocate for tribal sovereignty. Last week, the National Congress of American Indians announced it will host its 20th annual Sovereignty Run. The run will begin in early October on Cherokee lands in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. It will end more than 1,700 miles away in Sacramento, California. The event started in 2002 as a cross-country run to speak up against harmful Supreme Court cases. The running path spans Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. It is also being hosted in part to honor Jim Thorpe, whose gold medals have been reinstated. That original event 20 years ago was organized by NCAI President Fawn Sharp. She will be back again this year leading the run. To find more information, you can visit SovereigntyRun.org. In Canada, an Indigenous designer is preparing to wow the crowds at one of the biggest fashion events in the world. Mi'kmaq citizen Ingrid Brooks is all set to showcase designs inspired from her nation during New York Fashion Week. APTN's Angel Moore has the story. Ever since Ingrid Brooks was a child, fashion has been part of her life. Me and my cousins, we would play uh, like uh, fashion runway and uh, we were always uh, making our own little stages and I should have known back then what I was going to end up doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I was always, I always wanted to be like the boss, eh? Of the... <laughs> 
Now these Brooks designed gowns will be part of New York Fashion Week in a fashion show featuring independent designers. Brooks of the Indian Island First Nation hopes to network and learn. Like I wanna get um, um, a ready-made collection and hoping to meet people to connect with them and how they did it. Brooks designs are becoming a regular on the runway. Last June, they were at the Badaban Art Symposium in Fredericton, Indigenous Fashion Week in Toronto in 2018, and Paris Fashion Week in 2019. Brooks designs tell a story representing Mi'kmaq culture. This blue gown is Brooks' favorite. Made with cloth traditionally used for trade, the material can last up to 100 years, and sewn Mi'kmaq double curves with sequins. The print on this dress is a porcupine basket made by Brooks, featuring fire colors. When they look at her dress, they're gonna say, oh wow, this is Mi'kmaq porcupine quill work, and these are double curves. She, she's from the East Coast, she's Mi'kmaq. So, um, just to re represent where we're from, eh? And Worn with a Mi'kmaq peak cap and basket, featuring Mi'kmaq culture in fashion. This peak cap, Brooks made with trade cloth and microbeads, following designs that are over 200 years old. Brooks hopes to inspire youth to become fashion designers and represent Indigenous identity. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Indian Island, First Nation. Well, this is a fun one. Cheering crowds filled up an indigenous town in Ecuador last weekend as dressed up donkeys were once again allowed to race. The Great Donkey Race is over 874 yards and is part of annual celebrations in the local area. The races happen in the town of Salcedo, which is an agriculture, agricultural area with many indigenous communities. In nine years, only the rumble of a volcano and two years of pandemic protocols have kept the race from happening. One of the 65 donkey racers this year talked about what it takes to make it into the winner's circle. I am very happy, very excited to have participated this year in the donkey race. This is the third year I have participated. This is a race with a lot of adrenaline and competitors, so you need to be well trained to participate here. This year, organizers say thousands of supporters and spectators made a special trip both to the city to cheer on the donkeys and the humans. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. This is the third week of classes at the Ocheti Shakoi Community Academy in Rapid City, South Dakota. It is the first Indigenous-led school in the city and is a partnership between NDN Collective and the NACA-inspired Schools Network. Joining us to talk about the school is the founder, Mary Bowman. Hello, Mary. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Your grant opening was just held on September 7th. Tell us about the first class of students. Yeah, um, we are starting with kindergarten. This is all privately funded. Um, so we're starting with kindergarten. We'll add a grade each year. So we um, signed up 40 kindergarten kids and next year we'll add first grade and we'll keep going until we're K through 12. Um, and currently we are in a temporary space. We purchased a modular building um, to be on the land while we're waiting for our school to be finished that's, that we're building. Um, and, but there were some holdups there. So we were like last minute looking for a space and um, this church, St. Andrew's Church was very gracious and got us some space to use so we could open our school on time. I mean, talking about opening a school, there's so much I imagine that goes into that. Maybe tell us behind the scenes what some of the aspects are that you didn't really think about before you were opening the school. Jeez, let's see, there's so much. <laughs> and I have a journal I'm keeping of everything. so. Yeah, just to process it. Um, boy, I would say um, when we originally started with our plan, we said that we weren't going to have transportation, but that is a barrier that many families have trying to get their child to school. And then where we ended up having our location, our temporary space is clear across town. So we had to adjust for that. And um, we will be picking up students in a van. In the, the first few weeks, we gave gas cards to families, but that was it was still hard. Some families don't have cars. So um, it'll be nice, like once our school is built, that's part of what, that's another thing the Indian Collective is doing. They're creating um, affordable housing around the school. So the dream is one day the families will just walk to the school. 
How so different. I, say, I would say that's the I'm sorry to cut you off, but I actually <laughs> want to talk more about what you just said. I, I want to talk about how different the curriculum is at your school as, a, as um, compared to others. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, we know that, you know, boarding schools um, took away culture and language. And so um, that, you know, their whole thing was to assimilate our people. And they did a pretty good job of it. We have a lot of urban um, indigenous children who don't hear the language, they don't have speakers in their home, and they don't know anything about the culture. So um, we're trying to reverse that. So in all of the academic disciplines, there is um, culture, language, and that indigenous thought and philosophy of the Osheti Shakoi. So for instance, um, our math curriculum, we are piloting it, it's from um, Naka, and it's all Indigenous authors with Indigenous thought and philosophy as the big learning objectives. But in the meantime, kids are learning to read and they're seeing themselves in the books. You know, it's um, there are Native children in all the books. It's it's na So when you hear the stories, it sounds like a grandfather or grandmother telling the story. So um, that's all to have kids engaged and um, motivate it to do the learning. Our, um, our math is in, all in Lakota. It was developed by Thunder Valley. And um, kindergarten is pretty basic, you know, counting and um, uh, just rec doing number recognition and grouping and very small um, addition or subtraction, but it's all done in Lakota. They're hearing those phrases. Um, we are dual language, we're not um, immersion. And so, um, but they get a good dose of um, the language all day long, like in the math class. And then um, they, they go to Lakota language class for an hour each day. And then in the afternoon then, it's really focused on culture. We call it integrated Lakota studies. So they're doing, um, right now they're learning hand games because we're getting a little team ready to go to a hand games tournament, but they'll also learn like food sovereignty and a lot of other cultural aspects. Last week they went, we were very near a park. And when we had a picnic down there the first week we noticed, oh, they have choke cherries. They, it's by a creek. So they have chiaka, which is a tea that we harvest. And so last week they went down and they harvested choke cherries and then they made um, small pat, they, crushed them like our ancestors did. And then they made small patties and they'll take those home. So um, it's just an opportunity for students to be um, unapologetically indigenous and to be proud of who they are because uh, my parents, grandparents weren't allowed to. I want to ask what the reaction has been since this school has opened. I know that from parents and elders, having their children hear the language is probably something really significant to them. Yes, yes. I had a grandmother in, we were visiting in the hallway when they were starting class and each morning we start with a morning circle where they sing, um, we do um, a morning prayer in Lakota and then and, it, and the kids say it as well and then we do songs and we have a little girl who is a really good singer already and the kids, she starts and all the kids join in with her and then there are just some of those songs that, you know, that kids do in nursery school, but it's all in Lakota. And so they do that and the kids love that. But, and then the teacher will tell them in Lakota, let's go now, you know, we're gonna go to Lakota language and they'll break off into their groups. And she's like, I just love hearing that and hearing them sing in Lakota. And she's like, whatever I can do, she's like to help these kids flourish and the school to flourish. She's like, I, I'm here for it, whatever you need me to do. What a beautiful story. Mary, we could talk about this all day, but unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Leaders from the Native American Journalists Association met in Phoenix last month and unveiled a new logo. The 39-year-old organization started as the Native American Press Association, and now the name of the organization could change again. Francine Compton is the president of NAJA, and she joins us now virtually. Welcome, Francine. Hi, Leah. Thank you for having me. 
So first of all, congratulations on a successful conference. It was so wonderful to see everyone. Since the pandemic forced us to um, have the past meetings virtually, it was so wonderful to be with everyone. Um, I, I wanna jump right in here though, because a new logo was unveiled at the conference. So tell us about the process in terms of if this means the name has officially been changed or not. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on to tell you about that. And uh, it was a real honor to have the conference in person and also to present that logo concept to all the members in person. It had been so long, three very long years since we got to meet with everybody. And over the course of those three years, we, we really took our time looking at First of all, we did a, a survey of members in 2021, and uh, and I just looked at the results of those uh, that survey uh, this morning, just so I could share that with your audience. And when we surveyed members, 70% uh, said yes to a name change, and we also asked about international growth and. Uh, about 80% of the members are in favor of international growth. So we started surveying members back then, but we took it a step further and we had a Q&A session where members were able to join us and previous leadership, not just myself, but the past president was there for that. And it was a chance for us to answer any questions that members might have. And as you said, it's been so long since we've been together in person, we felt that we wanted to give members even more time and, and show them this logo, you know, that this, this can be the future. This is the future that we're looking toward and the heart of it for, for me. And, uh, and I heard it in your previous story and, and that's uh, a note about sovereignty. And I really feel that this is one way to give our organization sovereignty and to allow us to really expand on that story sovereignty that we all talk about in Indigenous journalism. When you held this Q&A with members of NAJA, what were the arguments in favor of changing it to the Indigenous Journalists Association and what were the arguments against changing the name? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the reactions that we heard most recently and, uh, and those were overwhelming that Number one, people felt that they could be more included in the organization. I heard from a lot of Indigenous journalists north of the medicine line who said that they felt that they would be represented in an organization with that name. And so that, that positive reaction was really good to hear. And of course, uh, we do want to hear the concerns from our members because that 30% those members matter to us too. And we want, uh, we would love to have a consensus on this. And we want all of our members to, to have the time and to really hear from us as a board and also hear from uh, reasons why, you know, part, another part of the heart of it for me is, as your previous guest was just talking about education and, and learning from each other. So for us to have journalists in our own communities reporting on our own people and communities, that's, that's really at the heart of it for me is to be able to plant more seeds and have more Indigenous journalists everywhere, not just in mainstream newsrooms, not just doing Indigenous news, but, you know, reporting on their community if they want to, uh, reporting on federal governments if they want to. If this name does get changed, um, would that change the mission of the Native American Journalists Association? That's a great question. It absolutely wouldn't change the mission. And uh, when I first became president of the organization, I really wanted to look into that history and to make sure that, you know, all of the, the steps that we were taking, we were taking them in the right direction and we were taking it with everybody in mind. So part of the research is that uh, I, I found that a couple of the founding members are also from north of the medicine line. So this organization, when it was created, it was created by journalists that also practiced uh, here in Canada. And, and so that, that really gave me a, a spark, you know, that I could carry on that torch that was passed on to me because 
as we said in our statement, as, as I said, uh, this is something that was talked about before I became a board member. And we've started using uh, Indigenous in a few of our programs. But that's another thing that's going to help us uh, expand is to attract more partnerships and programs with a name that, uh, as you know, too, at, at ICT, a name that, uh, a name change isn't easy, but a name that is attractive and more inclusive is going to attract uh, people, viewers, partnerships, members, which is very important to us. Absolutely. Well, President Francine Compton, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaliyah. Fifty years. That is how long it has been since the National Indian Health Board was established. The organization is celebrating this milestone next week at its annual National Tribal Health Conference in Washington, D.C. Joining us today is the CEO of NIHB, Stacey Bolin. Hello, Stacey. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Good to be here. Thank you, McWitch. What are the highlights of this year's conference? Well, we have a tremendous lineup of speakers at the conference. We have the Se Secretary Deb Holland will be there, Secretary of the VA. We're still waiting to hear on HHS Secretary Becerra, um, the uh, head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Rafael Walensky, will be there. Um, we have just tremendous uh, representation that will be accessible to all the folks who attend. We're very excited. Thank you for mentioning those guests. I was actually looking at the lineup and saw that um, folks like President Joe Biden have been invited. That's right. I mean, the trust for obligation for our people's health is from the highest forms of our government to the highest forms of the dominant culture stuck government. So it's totally appropriate that he's invited. We did have the vice president at our public health summit earlier this year. So we remain hopeful as He's very supportive of tribal health, the most supportive of any president, I would say, ever. So it wouldn't be too much of a stretch for him to show up in one way or another. As far as attendees of the conference, um, mm -hmm. who will actually be there? Well, we have over 700 folks registered uh, as of now. We have uh, our, our conferences was originally called the annual consumer conference, and it was designed for American Indian Alaska Native people who get their health care through the Indian tribal urban um, health care system through the Indian Health Service, direct service, self-governance tribes. Um, tribal leadership will be there, lawmakers, the head of the Indian Health Service with the with a, their senior leadership. Um, foundations and funders who want to engage in helping us improve our health and public health will be there. It's just a very robust, rich conference. It is the healthcare conference in Indian country. As I mentioned in my opening, uh, NAHB is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary. When you're looking back over that 50 years, is there a particular moment that stands out to you as a win for NIHB? Yes, there are many, many moments. I've been the executive director, changed that to chief executive officer, it's the exact same thing, um, for about 18 years. And in my time, um, seeing uh, the permanent reauthorization of the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act was a just groundbreaking, game-changing uh, victory for the tribes. But earlier on, the organization was founded in 1972 during the time of self-governance. The tribes decided that, you know, we had the worst health disparities, far worse than now, the shortest life expectancy, unfortunately, that has come back around as the CDC reported in late August. Um, but our, our tribal leaders from across the country said, this is enough. It's time to have our own organization where our national voice is heard, empowered, and listened to and so I'm just so proud to be part of this at this moment when people like, you know, Sally Smith and Buford Rowland and Mickey Piercy, Reno Franklin, um, Kathy Abramson, Howard Tommy, the leadership that's come through our doors has been phenomenal. And now our chairman, Bill Smith from Alaska, he's a veteran of the Vietnam um, War. And I mean, we're just flush with great leaders. We're so blessed. 
When we're looking into the future, there, of course, are big issues uh, that affect Indian country. You mentioned the life expectancy that has dropped. When you're looking towards the next 50 years of NIHB, what does that look like for you? It looks a lot different than what we're seeing today. And our board met in July and put down a vision for the next 50 years because we feel like we're standing in the middle of the river of seven generations behind us and seven generations yet to come. We're standing on the shoulders of all of our ancestors who had the presence of mind during the most uh, pressurized, life-threatening, life-taking era of negotiating treaties and all of them include healthcare. So we're standing on that vision. And our vision for the future is that the Indian Health Service will be fully funded. Self-governance will be implemented throughout the entire federal government because tribes know we know how to take care of our own people better than anybody. And it will be a mandatory program that we don't have to fight for every year, but the treaty and trust obligations will be met. And we'll just continue fighting for that as long as those of us who are have the who have the quiver and, and bow now can make that fight and inspire those who are coming after us to pick up those implements and keep pushing for it. Stacy, thank you so much. My pleasure, McQuitch. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.